Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? You are aware, I believe, by this time that the Bible is our authority. The Bible is the book that we use on this program to monitor what we are saying because you see the Bible is the law of God it is the Word of God it is absolutely trustworthy and dependable it contains the wisdom of God so that we don't have to trust in our wisdom it's just an absolutely marvelous fact that we can use such a magnificent book on this program the open forum and you know as a matter of fact not only can we use this uh, book as our authority for this program, but in Family Radio we have the opportunity to share this Word of God, this Bible, with the whole world. Just think of it. We have the opportunity to send the Gospel to cover huge continents and countries. Fact is, you know, we as believers are... Uh, who are true believers uh, take this very seriously we are commanded to to uh, uh, occupy until Christ comes we're commanded to go into all the world with the gospel uh, and in this and we're living in a day when God is using individuals to send out the gospel but by joining together in a ministry like family radio a great many of us pooling our resources. Uh, each of us then are being faithful to this command to go into all the world with the gospel. We're able to do things collectively that we could never do as an individual. Uh, just think of it, how many people can potentially be be uh, under the hearing of the word by a ministry like Family Radio. And you and I have the opportunity to dig into our pockets and provide the funds, provide the time. As a matter of fact, when you give a gift, that's, uh, that uh, is equivalent to time that you would spend to earn that money. Uh, you can get, you, we provide the funds and the time uh, in, in faithfulness to God's command to go into all the world with the gospel. And wonderfully, it results in a ministry like Family Radio where we can uh, cover all of mainland China every day with hours of programming by shortwave. And virtually, or a high percentage of mainland, mainland China uh, for hours on end by AM radio, a radio that uh, almost everybody is able to possess so that potentially we're able to reach uh, a, a billion people there with the gospel. And that's because you and I, we b combine our resources as individually. We carry out the command to go into all the world, and we join it together, our funds together, so we can do this. And anyone at all who's listening to Family Radio who really wants to use his life to the glory of God, and and uh, they're thankful that they can witness individually this wonderful Bible to others. They can also uh, um, uh, become even more effective and more uh, have a far greater outreach when they combine with other listeners in Family Radio to send out the gospel. Well, you see. We're talking about the Bible as our source book, and the Bible is everything, so that not only do we use it on this program, but we want to herald it forth into all the world, and this is the ministry of Family Radio. Now, before we take our first question from our telephone lines, we have a question here from a, a listener in Brazil. It is... Could you please explain Jeremiah 4, 23 to 29? Well, that's a fairly long passage in a book that has an enormous amount of information that uh, we should 
from time to time a look at, but I will at least take a, a very quick look at this. We read in Jeremiah 4, verse 23, a, a curious language, I beheld the earth. And lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I make, I will not make a full end. Well, now, this language of the earth was without form and void is identical to the language we find in Genesis chapter 1, where God says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the waters uh, were upon the, uh, and the spirit brooded on the face of the water, and it, there was no light because uh, at the end of that day God said, "Let there be light." In other words, God here is teaching us in Jeremiah four: there will come a time when this earth will have no occupants whatsoever. When will that be? Well, that will be right at the end. First of all, the true believers have all been raptured to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. All of the unsaved have been, ju have been judged and removed into hell, so there are no longer any people. And now the next event is that God will destroy this earth. He will burn it with fire. In fact, the whole universe will be destroyed. And, but that's not the end. He, notice here it says, I will not make a full end, because you see God also has in mind a new heaven and a new earth that in a sense will be built upon the foundations of this earth. And it is the new heaven and the new earth where the believers will spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and this uh, is what Jeremiah 4 is anticipating, I do believe. Now, these are the kind of things we learn when we read the Bible, when we read the Bible. And this is what we want to get out into the world. We want everybody in the world to be aware of what the Bible is teaching. And this is what we can do through a ministry like Family Radio as we seize the opportunity to use our resources uh, the money that God has placed under our care and keeping to further his cause of sending the gospel into the world. Well, thank you, Brazil, for that question. And now shall we turn to our first caller on our Open Forum, uh, forum line. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. I was hoping you'd be able to help me. Um, it's regarding Genesis chapter 2, and it's regarding the creation of man. And I, uh, my inquiry to you is why, uh, when Adam was created, God had mentioned to him about uh, the tree of knowledge. I was under the impression that when God created both Adam and Eve, that he informed them both at one time regarding the tree of knowledge. But as I was studying... Chapter 2, I noticed that Adam had been created first and was informed first regarding the tree of knowledge, and then later Eve was created. Uh, can I inquire as to why God informed Adam first and not Eve? Well, the, the fact is that in the family of Adam and Eve, because Adam was the husband and Eve was the wife, the, the husband is the... Uh, first has to answer to God. The wife is submissive to the husband. We read that later on, for example, in Ephesians chapter 5. The husband is, first of all, responsible. Now, actually, uh, Eve was already, not, even though uh, she uh, came later, she was in principle created with Adam because uh, she was in Adam. She 
you remember the Lord took a rib of Adam and made Eve from it so that she already was in existence as a rib at the moment of the creation of Adam and and uh, actually the the uh, command uh, ultimately came to both of them as a matter of fact when you go to Genesis chapter 3 uh, and Eve is tempted by the the serpent she knows full well what God had told Adam that they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil I see I see thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I have a question for you. Yes. Brother Camping. Uh, uh, the Bible says to love your enemies, right? Yes. Well, Satan is an enemy. Do we have to love him? Oh, no. We're not talking about, we're not to love uh, evil spirits. Uh, they are an enemy, of course, but we're not to love them because there is no potential possibility of salvation for them. But we are to love our fellow man, our fellow man who are spiritually an enemy because they're still a, in the kingdom of Satan after we have become saved. We've been translated into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we are, in that sense, enemies of theirs, and they are enemies of ours. But we are to love them in that we want the highest good for them. We want salvation for them. We can't want that for evil spirits, the fallen angels, because God has no plan of salvation for them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Captain. How are you doing? You're very well, thank you. Uh, um, will you uh, share with me in Matthew 24... 20, uh, 24, 27 verse and 28 verse. And Matthew 24 verse 27 and 28. Yes. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, what is your question? Yes. Um. My question is about uh, the eagles be gathered together where the carcass is. Yes. And um, I didn't you... ever know that uh, eagles be around carcass and things like that. I thought uh, buzzards and stuff like that be around carcass. Yeah, well, you see, that ties in with the language of Revelation chapter 19. Uh, where the same event is de is uh, disclosed to us only with slight with a different language, but it's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Judge of all the earth. In Revelation 19, it speaks of Him coming on riding on a white horse, and the armies of heaven following Him. That's a figure of speech to come, indicate that He's coming in righteousness, the the conqueror, the 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 uh, one who has won and then notice in uh, in uh, revelation 19 verse 17 and i saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven come and gather yourselves together together unto the supper of the great god that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and so on. In other words, it is the it is a picture, a portrait that Christ is painting of his final victory over the unsaved and over Satan. Uh, it's like a a conquering uh, army has finally vanquished the foe that they have been fighting with, and all the all the foe the the soldiers are all lying on the battlefield dead. And the birds of prey, the vultures and the eagles, are feeding on the carcasses. And that is the portrait that God is using to indicate Judgment Day, when the unsaved are under the wrath of God and are, they're standing for trial and are cast into hell. They are completely vanquished. Mm -hmm. 
And oh, I see. So um, when Christ's second coming, um, the eagles will be gathered around caucus and. Yeah, that's just a figure of speech to indicate that Christ has won, and the enemy is is completely vanquished. There, uh, Satan never again will threaten uh, Christ. He will never uh, be able to oppose Christ. Uh, the unsaved are are uh, completely under the wrath of God and subject to the judgment that is going to immediately come upon them and so they are typified like spiritually dead like those who are just carcasses upon which the vultures are feeding thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello yes um all right this is me i'm going to uh, my first question is in um, Isaiah 63. Let me see. Let me situate. Let me see Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verses 8 through 10. 63, verses 8 through 10. For he said, Surely they are my people, children, that will not lie. So he was their Savior in all their affliction. He was, uh, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. This is talking about God's plan of salvation. Verse 9, verse 10 also, Mr. King. Well, I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. And this is his plan of salvation, where God has has provided for salvation. But then it says, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make them himself an everlasting name? and so on and uh, and so uh, it it is indicating that except for the grace of god we would be in total rebellion against him and in fact collectively that is as a as a as a or divine organization like ancient israel of old or the like the church age uh, there were true believers but 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 uh, in general there was rebellion against God. The churches or ancient Israel wanted to go their own way. And yet within them, there are the true believers that, 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 that Christ has redeemed and cared for. All right. Um, my second question is, uh, there's some verses in the New Testament that indicate um, uh, Christ came to save the whole world, or that uh, so all men shall be saved. What, what, do you, what do you say to somebody like that? Well, the fact is, if you see, we first of all have to think out what does it mean to be saved. It means that all my sins have been paid for. I'm under the wrath of God by nature, and I'm subject to. Uh, the, uh, paying for my sins and the penalty is eternal damnation. If I've been saved, it means that I'm saved from hell because all of my guilt has been taken by the Lord Jesus Christ and I, and I have no payment to make. Now, if Christ had saved every human being, then had paid for the sins of every human being, then every human being would end up saved. There would be nobody that could be sent to hell. And yet, the Bible has plenty of verses to indicate that hell will be very heavily populated. And so we know that uh, when, he, sa when uh, he saved, he saved those that he, he uh, had named in the Lamb's Book of Life or that he had elected to salvation. This is why we read uh, uh, in Revelation 13, for example, about the... Uh, uh, it, where it talks about those who, who, um, uh, whose names in verse eight are not written 
in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. They will be worshiping the beast. That is, they'll be worshiping Satan during the, this great tribulation time. Their names right. were not written, therefore their, their sins had never been paid for. All right, uh, one more question. Um, in Acts chapter 2, in verse um, 17 yeah. through about 20, it talks about, I've, been, I've heard somebody giving me the argument before. They said that um, it talks about God, um, or about people prophesying to God and having visions and dreams and whatever. And then they said the next verse over, it talks about the, the coming of the end of the moon being darkened and the sun being darkened. But yeah, well, what is you see, uh, that in, the, in order for Acts 2 to take place, that is, the Holy Spirit to be poured out, Judgment Day had to come. Now, it wasn't the uh, Judgment Day at the end of the world, but it was the same kind of a judgment because Christ had to pay for the sins of all those he came to save. That was Judgment Day for him. Uh, the unsaved who or those who uh, God has not paid for their sins, they will experience that same judgment at the end of the world, except that Christ was eternal God, and so the penalty could be so intensified that it was all taken care of in the space of hours, whereas on the last day, uh, the unsaved will be spending an eternity in hell. But thank you for calling and sharing. Now let me caution our listeners, you know, we, we please don't call more than once a month, because if you do, you're going to run the risk of not being able to call any longer. We uh, we do like to uh, give this opportunity to as many others as possible to call in. So please don't call more than once a month. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Yes, could you explain uh, Revelation 16, verse um, verse 3, um, about the living soul died in the sea? Yeah. And I'll hang up. Well, in Revelation 16, we, we read in, uh, in, uh, in verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Uh, now, I'm sorry, I have never worked on this verse word by word, and so I'm, I'm not going to try to explain it. But I, I know that the context indicates that it's talking about the unsaved who are, uh, who are subject to the second death, eternal damnation. However, the, the phrase living, uh, I would want to look at more carefully, and so I really don't want to say more about it at this time. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I have a question on Isaiah. Uh, excuse me. Okay. Isaiah uh, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Let's look at that. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from uh, Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither, neither shall they learn war any more. Now this is a prophecy that actually encompasses the whole New Testament era. era. Uh, the term last days is a phrase that's picked up in Acts chapter 2 where it says in the last days uh, God said I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Uh, what is not seen in these verses, in these opening verses, is 
that there is two seasons that uh, during which this will all occur. There's the early rain and the latter rain. Uh, both are in view, though, because both uh, 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 during the first season it was uh, the time when God used a a um, a a um, uh, an institution like he used ancient Israel in the Old Testament, he used the churches and congregations, the local congregations, which were a divine institution God designed, uh, designed by God to send the gospel out. And then in the little season that came right at the end, the time of the final harvest, then he didn't use an institution any longer. He used individuals. But the principle is the same. It's all together the same that uh, that uh, uh, the uh, that he would uh, he would send the gospel into all the world and people would be redeemed. Um, okay, brother Camping does uh, Matthew chapter twenty four verse sixteen. Yes. Can I relate that to to Isaiah two and three? Well, Matthew twenty four verse sixteen. Am I seeing that correctly? Matthew 24, verse 16. Yes, sir. There we read, uh, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, this is talking about a different matter. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 2, in the opening verses, God is simply setting forth His divine program for the New Testament era, that, there, that, uh, that He would uh, be bringing the gospel to the world. And... But between the early rain of the first season of the New Testament and the latter rain, the final season, there will be a time when the believers have to leave Jerusalem. That is, they have to leave the local congregations, which are made up at that time of the Jerusalem above and the Jerusalem which is now. They leave that, but they don't actually leave the eternal Jerusalem. We can't get out of that. We are eternally in the, those who are in Jerusalem above, that is, they whose citizenship is in heaven, we never can leave that. But insofar as the, the holy place where the, where the churches operate, or where the gospel operates, rather, throughout the first season of the New Testament, yes, the, Jerusalem in that sense we have to leave that, according to Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and so on. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. I also have a question from the book of Isaiah. Um, I was wondering if Isaiah 22, verses 20 through 25, is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at that. Isaiah 22... Twenty, uh, uh, verse twenty-two. No, verses twenty through twenty-five. It does mention an Eliakim. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Unquestionably, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open, and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagons, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down. That's talking about the fact that this Christ had to pay for our sins. He was cut down, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. He had taken upon himself the sins of all those he had come to save. This, without any question, is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello. 
Yes, so hi, Brother Camping. I'm so happy I got through. Um, my question is, when I, I was married when I was very young, at 18, and my, at, well, at that time I didn't, you know, know whatever. My husband at the time was a homosexual, and he asked me to divorce him, so I gave him a divorce. As, since then, I've remarried, and I have a family now. I have children and everything. Um, I bought, I, I, I sent for that uh, booklet that you wrote. Um, oh, goodness. What uh, brought us joined together. What that has joined together, right. Yes. Um, and I read it, but it doesn't say anything about, you know, a marriage ending because one of the, the you know, one of the people is homosexual. So I'm, I'm, I'm... Well, the fact I'm is, I'm afraid about my salvation now because I'm, I'm, am I condemned forever? Now I'm an adulterer. My husband. Oh, I, no. oh let's let's see if we can get a proper perspective on this. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, don't uh, try to mitigate or try to turn away from the fact that any divorce is sin. Any divorce is sin. Any marriage after divorce, when the when the uh, former spouse is still living is sin and there are, uh, there are no exceptions your husband was a homosexual or, you know, he could have been anything at all but he was your husband and it was his sin to divorce you but it was your sin to marry again however that sin stands right alongside with uh, thousands thousands of other sins that you've ever committed now if you are saved it means that every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit has all the guilt has been taken by the Lord Jesus Christ and you're eternally secure in him and God is, remembers those sins no more if you are not saved then you are going to hell uh, if you don't become saved you are going to hell not only for the sin of remarriage but for a thousand for thousands of other sins that you have committed however now that you are married a second time you can't divorce and so now you continue in your second marriage as if it were a first marriage and uh, if you have truly become a believer you can know that all the sin connected with this have has all been covered by the Lord Jesus Okay, thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Can you describe the uh, acronym TULIP? Can I describe which? TULIP. TULIP? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, that's a device simply to lay out uh, five very important biblical doctrines. T stands for total depravity, the fact that before we're saved, we're totally depraved. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh uh, after God. U, the second letter of Tulip, uh, signifies unconditional election. In other words, when God decided to save me or anyone else, it isn't because I or anyone else met any conditions uh, to achieve that position. It was God's sovereign good choice, and he uh, he ha was under no no uh, duress to name me any more than anybody else. Uh, it uh, it was totally unconditional. Uh, L, the next letter in Tulip is limited atonement or particular atonement. It means that. Uh, the payment for sin uh, identifies only with those who were the elect of God. They are the only ones that Christ followed through with by paying for their sins. I, the next letter in Tulip, is irresistible grace. And that uh, means that when God intends to save someone, no one can resist him. No one can resist him. Uh, in fact, is what he does. He he gives us a brand new resurrected soul, and we have nothing at all to do with that. That's his business entirely. And in our new resurrected soul, we love the Lord, and 
love the Word of God and, and we would never, never, never think about uh, resisting the grace of God. And so irresistible grace is really saying that God saves those who He wishes and nothing that man can do could resist that if God had named that person. It is indicating that we have, once we are saved, we are comforted by God, we have experienced the grace of God, we're no longer at enemies of God, we are, our, our payment, the payment for our sins has been fully paid in every sense of the word. And one more uh, thing, go to Acts 17.30, please. Acts 17.30. 30. Acts 17, 30. Correct. There we read, And the times of this ignorance God winked at or overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now we have to read this in the context of the whole Bible. It was not God's plan throughout the first 11,000 years of the history of the world to send the gospel into all the world. Men, mankind lived and died and, and they are guilty before God and they're going to stand at the judgment throne of God to answer to God. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, because they uh, uh, are in rebellion against God. But now that uh, we're reading Acts 17, God had begun his plan to evangelize the world. And so the message is to go out into the world to repent, to cry to God, to uh, uh, come to the Lord Jesus, to trust in Him, to have your sins washed away. And, uh, and of course, only God can do that. And so, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, once, uh, once Christ went to the cross and rose again and the Holy Spirit was poured out and in Acts chapter 2, from that time on, wherever the gospel is, has been proclaimed, God has been saving people. Mm -hmm. Throughout the church age, this has been occurring. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. I'd like to ask a question and then hang up and hear it over the air. I'm puzzled with Psalm 86 verse 11 and it's that last part and I'm wondering if David is saying there may my heart be in agreement with my mouth and not as Jesus addressed the uh, Pharisees I believe it was in the New Testament where he quotes from Isaiah and says the people draw near to me with their lips but their heart is far from me again thank you for taking my call Thank you for your time, and at Psalm 86, 11. Thank you, and let's look at Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. That's a very interesting psalm. Uh, it is, of course, a the kind of a thing that the true believer earnestly desires because he's been given a new resurrected soul he has an intense desire to be obedient uh, to God's way to God's law and so first of all he has to know what God's law is as he reads the Bible he is praying again and again oh Lord give me understanding of at least some of what I am reading here that's another way of saying teach me Teach me from uh, what thy way is, what thy law is, because my desire is to walk in thy truth. Uh, that is, to walk in Christ. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, uh, and in, uh, in Revelation 19, uh, his name is called True. And so, uh, I will walk in thy truth. That is, I will walk in the way of Christ. I will walk 
uh, uh, I, my desire is to walk as Christ walked and that is why we so carefully read the Bible and that's why we're constantly praying that we might be faithful to this word now the next phrase is a, a unique phrase unite me or re unite my heart to fear thy name in other words we want our hearts united with God's heart. We want to be one with Christ. We don't want to have our agenda and Christ having his agenda. We want to have the identical agenda. We, from the very essence of our being, we want to be like Christ. For then we will fear his name. Then we will understand the wonder of serving this uh, magnificent Lord that is the Lord Jesus Christ, this wonderful God who has saved us, this wonderful being who has created the heavens and the earth and has and uh, rules over it with all of his power. This is the desire of the child of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. There's three things I'd like to ask you. The first, if, if you know, somebody called you earlier, a uh, lady did about being, she got remarried. Yes. And, or let's say, like, somebody's not following the order of First uh, Timothy in the church. Uh, all these people that sin like that, or... Oh, are their sins forgiven, or how can that be? If they say they're saved and they went and did error, how can how can that be? Well, the fact is, if if someone claims to be saved, and all kinds of people claim to be saved, and yet in their lifestyle and in their walk they they are in rebellion against God, that is evident that they are not saved. They can say they are saved, but that isn't what makes us saved. We we can make all the claims we want. The only uh, way we can become saved is if God gives us a brand new resurrected soul. And if we have a brand new resurrected soul, there will be an intense desire to do the will of God so that it will come true what is asked for in First John chapter 2, verse 3, that uh, we, we say we know him, and we know we know him because we keep his commandments. We have that and that ongoing desire to do the will of God. Now we don't do it perfectly because we still live in a body that is not saved, but uh, our lifestyle and our motivation and our intents and our desires are entirely different from what they were before we were saved. The second thing, if if somebody does something wrong to a Christian, will God Will God deal with these people here on earth that while they're living to somebody that has done oh, something wrong to a Christian? Oh, not necessarily at all. You see, when Christ says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, the vengeance, the, the final comeuppance for that individual, the final uh, uh, assessment of his situation and what he needs is at the judgment throne of God. No one gets away with any kind of a crime. They all have it all has to be answered to by God and but but God does tell us vengeance is mine I will repay we are not to ever respond uh, in, uh, angrily or or uh, resentfully or violently against those who insult us or those who try to hurt, harm us uh, we are to love them and understand that they're under the wrath of God and therefore have great pity for them and, and great uh, desire that somehow they might turn to that Christ might save them so that they will not be under the wrath of God for these crimes last thing I'd like to ask you you know how you say the church age has ended and I've been studying the Bible but can some of that Brother Camping, be mine and yours, maybe personal opinion interpreted instead of being led by the Lord? Can we be making a mistake? Well, you know, this is something that I have been puzzling about for over 20 years. Already 14 years ago, I wrote a book, The Final Tribulation, and I recently reviewed it, and I found I made 
uh, a great many statements in there that are identical to what I am saying now. I didn't see the latter rain at all. I didn't know what the final outcome was, but I did make the statement that, and, and make a strong point of it that time would come when there would be no longer anybody saved in the whole world. I didn't see the latter rain. Actually, it's only in the church where nobody could become saved finally. And so this is not a Johnny-come-lately, a, a, a hasty kind of a thing that's just from a casual reading of the Bible. These uh, truths that uh, I'm uh, enunciating and teaching have been, uh, been subjects that I have studied and, and studied and studied and studied and, and prayed for wisdom and taught uh, throughout the years uh, for a long, long time, except that now... Uh, because uh, we're so close to the end, I'm able to begin to tie it all together in a, in a, in a, uh, I can see the whole f fabric I, instead of just seeing pieces as I had heretofore. Can I, I ask you one last thing? Yes. When I was talking about can God deal with some people here on earth that mistreat Christians, can he do that too rather than wait till the judgment? Well, the, 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 the fact is that God does send disasters. There are volcanoes. There are people who die uh, unexpectedly. There are, uh, uh, and sometimes these are chastisements. Uh, sometimes they are simply warnings that there's a judgment day coming. But insofar as payment for sin, payment for sin, that will all be fully accomplished on the last day as that individual stands before the judgment throne of God. That, there's no part of that pe penalty of payment for sin that is paid on this side of judgment day. Now, God may, uh, may uh, send difficulties into that person's life. It might be a blessing in order to try to get their attention so they might turn to the Lord. Or it may be a chastisement to uh, open up their spiritual eyes or to test them or whatever. But it never is payment for the crime that they, that they committed. That payment is on the last day. Thank you, Brother Cameron. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Hello? Go ahead with your call, please. Yes, um, I have a question about singing psalms. Um, some Bible studies and some churches claim that they sing psalms. Um, if they're not singing them right directly from the, from the Bible, from the Word of God, how can they proclaim that they're singing psalms? I, I'm sorry, you're, uh, are you asking the question, should we only sing psalms? No, there are some churches who say that they sing psalms. And if they're not singing them from the Bible, from word to word, if they have their own translations, how can they say that they're singing psalms? Well, I don't know. You have to ask them. And the uh -huh. fact is they're doing their best to try to remain faithful to that psalm, even though they may have to uh, change their language around a little bit in order to fit into the music that they're using. Uh, but uh, that is their intent. Right. And, and, of course, any time we have intent, it doesn't mean that we're going to realize uh, in the fullest expression or the fullest way uh, our intent, but at least that is their intent to be as faithful as possible to the Psalms. Okay, my, I have one more other question. Um, my wife and I are, uh, uh, her and I have four kids, and none of our children are saved, and we were in the process of making out a will does the Bible say anything about when your children are lost, leaving money to your children who are lost, or maybe to a ministry or something like that? No, the Bible doesn't have anything at all to say about that. We, in fact, that one, that child who is lost today doesn't mean they're going to end up lost. You don't know if God is, has elected that child. Right. Uh, yeah, it may be uh, if the Lord would tarry. Uh, and we were back uh, a couple of hundred years ago or a hundred years ago, and that person could live out a normal life. It could be that at the age of 60 or 70 or 80, 
they finally did become saved. We we don't make any we can't make any uh, decisions based on that. And right. they're, they're all your children. And you 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 may have one child that is that is uh, got uh, uh, impairments of some kind, physical impairments, and so they need a little extra help. So you might remember that in your will. Uh, and it may be that. Uh, Later on, you'll change your will. Your your children may grow up and and uh, be plenty self-sufficient, so they don't e need any more help. And then you may want to change your will so that uh, if you if the Lord would take you, uh, your money could go to uh, a ministry uh, or that sends out the gospel into the world. Right. Uh, those things can be very flexible. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, it's a verse in the Old Testament. I don't know if it's in the Psalms or Proverbs, but um, I believe uh, it, it, it says that money answereth all things. Now, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's saying that whether you're a believer or not, we happen to live in a world where... You know, uh, money. You know, buys us security, and uh, I know all of us need security here on earth, whether we're saved or not. But maybe it means maybe it has another spiritual meaning of some kind. Well, in the New Testament, we read that money, the love of money, the right. love of money, is the root of all kinds of evil, and and uh, because it very quickly becomes a god. You put your finger on it. We look at money as being secure security actually that is not true of course because uh, uh, the stock market can go broke or can go way down and we can lose our our nest egg over in that way or uh, the uh, uh, other things calamities can happen uh, so money is a it appears to be a, uh, some kind of security but really there's nothing in this world that really gives us security. Everything is transient. In fact, our own lives are, are, are not secure because we have no guarantee we'll be alive tomorrow. The only thing that is security, and this is true, eternal security, is when we have become saved. When we have become saved, we've been given eternal life. And it makes no difference what happens in this world, whether we live long or short, whether we uh, die rich or poor. It makes no difference. We're going to, uh, at the moment we die, we're going to be with Christ in heaven and under the highest happiness possible, uh, the highest blessing possible. And there's nothing in this world that can secure that at all. Only Christ can secure it. And that is where we ought to place our focus. Am I ready to meet God? Have I become a child of God? And then these other things, whether we have a little money or a little more money, whether we, uh, whether we are healthy or not quite so healthy, all of those become relatively, totally insignificant. Uh, why, does, why did the Old Testament say that money answers all things? It in the Old Testament. I, I kind of puzzled over that. Well, uh, if, if there is such a verse, it might be in Ecclesiastes, but... Uh, oh, there or, is. I've, I've read it, yeah. Or Proverbs someplace there. But the fact is, that is to mankind. Right. That's, that's right. their solution. Because if you have money, you can buy friends, you can buy uh, uh, health to some degree, you can buy fine food, you can buy pleasure, uh, you can buy uh, whatever this world has to offer. Money is is very wonderful to this world, but it's all very temporary, very tentative. I know. Because the moment you die, and that could be uh, tomorrow, the moment you die, everything that money has bought disappears. You can't take one thing with you, and so it is a it is an illusion. It is totally a mirage that somehow in that money there's some kind of security. There really is not at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And we're going to pause right now 
for this message, and then we're going to go to our next call. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a question on the uh, corporate church. Yes. Uh, we've been uh, listening to the teaching that the corporate church is made up of Jerusalem above and Jerusalem below. Yes. And uh, analogized by... Uh, uh, gold, silver, and precious stones of the true believers and wood, hate, and stubble for the, uh, really the unbelievers. And with that in mind, in Daniel 11, verse 38, it seems to be talking about um, actually Satan or the Antichrist. And, and let's, let's look at that. Daniel 11, verse 38. Um, well, we uh, let's start with verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation, that is, until judgment be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Without question, this is talking about Satan as he rules in the churches, and he is being worshipped as God. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And that's the desire of Satan, to be like God, so that he is worshipped as God. Now verse 38, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And I can see your question. Here it's talking about gold, silver, and precious stones. Uh, uh, and how do we tie that in? And I'm not sure how we do. I don't, I don't know. Uh, 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 I, I have never worked through these verses, uh, verse by verse. The uh, Daniel 11 is not an easy passage to, to uh, work through and understand. And I'm afraid that if I try to give some, uh, some opinion here, I, I will be speculating, and I don't want to do that. Yeah, many, m much of the uh, pre-tribulation uh, rapture teaching uses this chapter, and and this, of course, signifying some man being the Antichrist, and uh, and I just wondered if, if the gold, silver, and precious stones has something to do with true believers' involvement with the Antichrist or Satan, or you know, some type of well, conflict uh, going on there. Uh, well, we don't know. I. The, uh, Again, uh, for example, this may, and this may be far-fetched. I, I don't. I, I'm only speculating right now. But right. Uh, he's honoring with gold, silver, and precious stones. That is by driving them out, by getting victory over them. That's a possibility. Okay. But I, 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 I'm not prepared to make a judgment on this at all. Okay. Well, I, I was just curious about the gold, silver, yeah. and precious stones because yeah. we use that for true believers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. Uh, first of all, these are Hebrew words, whereas in the New Testament they're Greek words. And uh, to really develop this, when uh, each of these words have to be looked at very carefully, and we have to uh, uh, look very carefully at uh, uh, at the context. And this this is one of these verses that. Uh, it just does not lend itself to easy understanding, and that's not untypical of many verses in the Bible. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, good evening. Yes, good evening. Okay, let's, let's read um, Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Verse 4. Verse 4. Okay. Uh, where Christ said, Behold, all souls are mine, uh, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Where okay. Christ, where, Hello? Yes. Okay. 
Over here, the Bible says that every soul that sins, it shall die. And you always see that uh, we have a new resurrected soul or whatever. Yeah. And you believe that when someone dies, he doesn't actually die, he goes to heaven. Um, this text it teaches that when someone sins, it will die. And when that, that person dies, he doesn't go to heaven. You, you, your teaching is contrary to what the Bible is saying here. Oh. How can you reconcile this text to... Oh. oh, well, because this is describing mankind as we are by nature. We are all sinners. There's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that doeth any good. There's none that seeketh after God. We are all souls that have sinned and they were under the judgment of God. But when God saves us, He paid for our sins. He paid the penalty demanded by the law of God. And so now we're not subject to that penalty, which is the second death, eternal damnation. We're not subject to that any longer. Fact is, from now on, God looks upon us as if we have never sinned. The guilt of every sin we'll ever commit or had committed in the past has all been taken by the Lord Jesus and the payment has been made. So now we stand looking perfectly righteous to God. Even though we still uh, will commit sin, that sin too has already been paid for by the Lord Jesus. But the point I'm trying to make here is you teach us that when someone dies and he's saved, according to your language, he goes to heaven. Yeah. And and the Bible teaches that you and yours to the end is the one who will be saved. So there is there is a possibility that someone might start very good in his in his Christian life and in the end he will he will end up getting lost, someone like King Saul. He, he, he was the first king of Israel, and yet because he couldn't, I mean, he, would, he wasn't obedient to God throughout his life, he, he ended up, I mean, consulting witches and all of that, and he, lo he, he died in a sense. So Saul was not saved. Well, excuse me, you see, the, the fact is that if we have truly become saved, we will endure to the end. Remember John 10, nothing can snatch us out of our Father's hand. Nothing can snatch us out of Christ's hand. Read Romans 8, the closing verses. There's nothing in, uh, in all creation that can separate us from the love of God. This is the... Uh, but but if we're not saved, and we think we're saved, we uh, everybody tells us we're saved. <laughs> Excuse me. But we're not saved. That means that we will not endure to the end because we we uh, we uh, uh, we have not received eternal life. And so, if we endure to the end. That will, that will be simply another evidence that we had to indeed become saved. So, so my question is, are you saved? Am I saved? Yeah. Oh, I've been asked that again and again. And, and as I read the Bible and I find an intense desire to do the will of God, then I have the evidence I am a child of God. I, I, I have a want to, and I try to do the will of God more and more. That's my delight. I'm happiest when I do it. And that's, the, uh, that's what should be the experience of everyone who has become saved. However, if we uh, hesitate to, to be obedient to the Bible, we don't want to give up doctrines that, that please us, even though we're to, uh, the Bible says something different, that may be the evidence that we're not saved. Okay, so my, you haven't answered my question. I said, are you saved? I've said, I answered that. I said, there's all kinds of evidence in my life, at least in my judgment, that I, I am a child of God. Moreover, Romans 8 says that 
God's Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are a son of God. And as we, if we truly are saved, the more we read the Bible and identify with it and are happy with it and have a delight in it, we get the assurance, an increasing insurance that we are saved. And okay, thank you. I understand that. Okay, well, well thank listen, you. Okay, I have a question. I have another question. All right, one more question. Okay, you, you, you believe that you are saved. Okay, and yet there are so many teachings of yours which is in contrary to what the Bible says. Okay, for instance, let us take a look at um, Colossians chapter 2, verse, um, verse 14 down. Yeah. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, and made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drinks, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. You always use this text to, especially verse 15, to show that uh, God abolished the Sabbath. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You, uh, you, uh, your interpretation of the Bible in this situation is wrong because uh, in, in verse 14, if you read up in verse 14, it says the handwriting of requirements. The handwriting of requirements that Paul is talking about here is the ceremonial laws that Mo uh, Moses wrote in a book. That was what was nailed to the cross. Yeah, but let's go on to verse 16 now. We, the fact is, verse 16 says, to Let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day or new moon or the Sabbath. Now, these are the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. And Christ explains in verse 17 that, and they have all been done away. That was the... Uh, they, they have all been fulfilled in Christ, and because they were, but they were a shadow, they were a sign pointing to uh, the nature of salvation, pointing to what Christ had to do to be, make us saved. And so, uh, it's, uh, it's there's no question at all that we're not to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And when you insist on doing that, you're in rebellion against God. You are saying. Uh, I know more than God, and the, and unfortunately, this is what some churches teach, and the people blindly, slavishly follow along because their church teaches that. But the but the Bible doesn't teach that. But Hello? thank you. Uh, look, we've talked about the Sabbath many days, times, and I'm sorry you cannot see this. Uh, I pray that the Lord might open your eyes. I can't make you open your eyes. The Bible is very plain. The Sabbaths are a shadow of things to come. That's ceremonial law. Men, you may not like it, but that's what the Bible is saying. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Carol Camping. This yes. is the lady who contends that the Genesis 1 is the foundational truth of the Bible and everything must be read taking the context of Genesis 1 into consideration. But before, as you know, I've called you four times in four years, and each time you have cut me off. I can never get finished. So there are four areas that I would like to put out to you before discussion, and then you can take one at a time. The first one, since the gentleman was just talking to you, I'd like to share with you... Um, something so that you could comment on it. Well, excuse me, are you, are you, do you want to talk about the seventh day Sabbath? No, I just want to read something to you about the seventh day Sabbath. Well, but this, <laughs> no, it's a fact. you're saying I cut you off. The problem is, let me say this, uh, the, the problem is this question comes up again and again and again. And, and I point to verses like Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 or, or uh, Exodus chapter 31, where the Sabbath is a sign that is indicating that I, the Lord, sanctify you. 
and and you don't you people don't listen to that you don't listen to that you are listening to your church uh, and if you happen to be seventh day adventist then you're listening to one of your church uh, uh, farmers who had a vision with a halo around the fourth commandment that meant already uh, she was listening to something other than the bible she had an authority other than the bible and and yet that very halo locks a lot of people into thinking that is truth and that's the that's the the terrible nature of having an authority other than the bible and so you the you can uh, you can uh, we can visit together about this but it goes nowhere it goes nowhere because you won't listen to colossians chapter 2 here it says very plainly the sabbaths are named along with the new moons and the feast days and they are a shadow of things to come if if the passover day was a shadow if the uh, if the feast of tabernacles was a shadow if the uh, uh, blood uh, if the uh, uh, blood circum uh, the blood uh, offering was a shadow if the burnt offering was a shadow uh, then the sabbath is a shadow and they were all uh, a shadow of the reality and the reality is that the sabbath was pointing to the fact we're not to work for our salvation we're not to work for our salvation and if if you wanted uh, i'm glad our last caller at least wanted to talk about verse 16 uh, but 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 again he's not listening to what verse 16 is saying if you want to talk about deuteronomy 5 where God says why we are to keep the seventh day Sabbath because I brought you out of the nation of, out of Egypt well then we see yeah because it's a sign of salvation and and th these are the things we have to talk about but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum okay um, uh, Paul advised Timothy to drink a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake, right? Uh, I'm sorry, would you repeat that, please? Paul. Paul. He advised Timothy to drink a little wine. A little wine for your stomach's sake and your many ailments. In other okay. words, God is teaching that wine can be used for medicinal purposes. Okay. Um, where about in Proverbs? It says that... Proverbs 20 verse 1. It says, Wine is a mocha. Strong drink is rich. Yes. And anyone who is deceived thereby is not wise. Yes. And more than that, in Deuteronomy or in Proverbs 31, God says, It is not for kings to drink wine or desire strong drink. And every true believer is spiritually a king. Okay. Now, uh, uh, and um, Jesus, during the Last Supper, uh, gave the disciples some wine, right? Jesus did not drink wine, and we don't even read about any wine at the Last Supper. We don't, uh, there was a cup. What was in the cup? God does not say. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he never used the word wine. He used the term, the fruit of the vine, or he used the uh, phrase, the cup. He never used the word wine. Now, there may have been wine at the Lord's, at the Last Supper, but Christ would not have drunk it because he was a king. Not only that, he was the high priest, and neither the high priest nor a king were to drink wine. Um, throughout the Bible, the, the term wine is used to represent both fermented and unfermented grape juice. The fermented grape juice is the one that is advised in Proverbs 20 that we shouldn't drink. The one that Paul was advising Timothy to drink is still wine, fresh from the from from the vine. Yes. And and that's the same that's the same wine that Jesus said to the disciples. Well. During the Last Supper. Yeah, but. Okay. But it's me, a different. Me, I'm trying to make a point here. What is your you what know, is you excuse know. me excuse me would you please tell me what your point is what are you trying to drive at. Okay. The Bible, the Bible uses the term wine generally. So, it's de depending on the context 
into which it is used, then you know the meaning of the, the type of wine the Bible is using. Uh, you, you just read uh, Colossians 2 verse 16, and you are trying to just pick up that text. Uh, for the Sabbath that you see uh, in the text. Yeah, excuse me. When Bible. God when God uses the word wine in the Bible, it's fermented wine. There is no, no, no evidence anywhere that it was not fermented. It's not. There's no evidence anywhere. And even for example, God uses the phrase new wine in Acts two, and yet it's in the context of. Of the, do you suppose these men are drunken? Uh, they they are intoxicated, and so we. And when he uses the word Sabbath, he's talking about the seventh day Sabbath. That is the word that is used throughout the Old Testament again and again and again, and it ties in. Excuse me, perfectly with passages like Exodus 31 and Ezekiel and so on, where God speaks of the Sabbath as a sign that I, the Lord, sanctify thee. That's the purpose of a shadow. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Captain, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Oh, uh, I like to. Do you think you could give me any any information on First uh, John, uh, chapter three twenty one to uh, twenty two? First John, chapter three, verse twenty one and twenty two. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, th then we have we confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask. We receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, what is your question? Okay, my question is uh, Tess of Spirits. Tess of Spirits and Chapter 4. Oh, you're looking at Chapter 4. Tess well, it goes on and on and on, right, doesn't it? Um, well, the later on God, it does right? test the spirits, but how do we test the spirits? We test them to see if uh, where the message is coming from. If someone says, I had a glorious vision, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ, and he told me thus and so, uh, to read uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 10 again and be okay. obedient, I, I would know immediately that's an evil spirit, that's Satan, because yeah. Christ would never do anything like that. We test the spirits by seeing, saying, first of all, determining what is their authority. Like, for example, those who are who are listening to uh, someone who had seen a halo around the fourth commandment yeah. uh, as a vision, uh, then immediately I know that that was of Satan because Christ would never break the silence between the supernatural and the natural. And if it's of Satan then I would be frightened at what is being said there. Mm -hmm. I know, but uh, there has to be something other than that, don't you think? Pardon? Do, do you think there would be something other than that? Because I've, I've, I've tested a lot of spirits, and the only, the only way I can test it you know, with, uh, with uh, religious people is by their fruits. Well, but you're testing people, but if we're going to test what spirit. what spirit, is it the, the Holy Spirit, spirit or is it, a, is it Satan who is motivating people? We first, the major way we test is what are they, what are they, uh, what are they, what is the source of their information? Then, secondly, we can test the spirits in the sense that well, is their conclusion are in agreement with the Word of God, or are they saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord has not said it all? Then we know that it's out of their own minds if what they are concluding is not firmly based on the Scripture itself. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. I was hoping for some help with Ezekiel chapter 12. Ezekiel chapter 12, okay, and what verse? verse? Verses 10. Ezekiel 12, verse yes. 10. Let's 10, and going down kind of through uh, verse 15. Yeah, we won't have time, but 
uh, let's begin. Say thou unto them, and thus saith the Lord God, this burden, and the bur word burden in this context is message. This message concerning the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel that are among them, say, I am your sign, like as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his sush shoulder in the twilight and shall go forth they shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby he shall cover his face but he see not the ground with his eyes this this of course identifies somehow with the with the very period that we're living in but again this is difficult language and i have not worked through it and and i'm not ready at all to try to make a given explanation of it i that would not be wise for me to do so you don't know who the prince in Jerusalem is? I, no, I'd rather not not uh, 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 try to answer that because I've never worked on this passage. Okay, in reference to burden, over in Jeremiah chapter 23, starting like at 33, everyone keep, keep, the God keeps saying, don't say the burden of the Lord. When people ask, what is the burden of the Lord? God says, don't say that or... Do you see that there? Yes, and when the people or the prophet or a priest shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden? That is, what is the message of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? What message? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his throne. In other words, in this context, God is simply saying that the one message that the church I better listen to in this day when when God's wrath is upon it is that I will punish you. That is the message that better be listened to. But okay, with that, I have to say good night because we have come to the end of our time. Now let's continue to read the Bible, read the Bible very, very carefully, because that is the source of truth. There's no, I don't trust what I say. Just trust the Bible and pray that the Lord might open your spiritual ears and understanding of what the Bible is saying. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.